Welcome to Speed Talk Live, which isn't really live, but a poorly produced podcast where we talk about NASCAR and all things racing. And occasionally we have a special guest or two. When we can get them to show up. Set down, strap in, pull those belts tight. Speed Talk Live is on the air. Race car is in. Green flag, green flag, green flag. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Speed Talk Live. I'm Greg Engel. We're glad to have you. I took a week off. I'll explain that in a minute. I am here with my associate editor at CupScene.com, Owen Johnson. Hello, Owen. How are you? Hello, Greg. It's great to see you again. Yeah, we took a week off. I mean, I didn't take a week off. I was traveling, but uh, my, uh, my, my technology hasn't caught up with me yet on the road. So we're going to figure that out so we can do it on the road. Didn't have good internet where I was working during the week, so we weren't able to do a show last week. That's okay because, by gosh, we got a lot to talk about in since the All Star Race, where I was at the All Star Race at North Wilkesboro, then I was at the Coke Six Hundred. Now I'm back home in Orlando. If you hear anything in the background, by the way, uh, I live on nearly half acre, but the the neighbor behind me decided that this afternoon will be a great day, great time to uh, cut some trees down. So they're back there cutting trees down. It's 96 degrees here, so obviously he's a little crazy. But if you hear that in the background. That's what's going on. Um, you know, uh, we Floridians, we we don't think sometimes. But, hey, it's 96 degrees. Have at it. Drink a lot of water. So let's talk about the All-Star Race. I went to North Wilkesboro for the second year in a row and absolutely loved it. We got there. I got there on Friday, went there Friday night um, for all the festivities there. Saturday, though, we had a huge rainstorm. Um, and, and it looked like for a time that that we weren't going to have anything because the, the rain we had, we had, I think four inches in two hours, there was also wind and it blew the portalettes over. It blew garbage cans over. I mean, it was awful. Uh, we lost power in the media center and that's only the second time that's ever happened to me in the, the 20 some odd years I've been covering this sport uh, to be stuck in a media center with, with no power but I was, we were eventually able to get out. It took us several hours to get out of the parking lot. And truth be told, I didn't think they were actually going to be able to recover in time to, to have an actual all-star race. Um, they canceled the rest of Saturday. Uh, we had some truck qualifying that day. <clears throat> the cup qualifying went, went uh, on as planned. They were going to do the heat races. Those got canceled. Um, and I really didn't think uh, we could have a chance looking at the damage I saw around the track. Uh, and some of you probably saw the pictures and the videos. Uh, there were tires floating. There's somebody, there was a crew member uh, who was jumping in in the water uh, down between turns one and two. I mean, it was cr incredible. And uh, I really questioned whether they're going to have it. But, you know, as the light was fading, uh, Steve Swift led a rally meeting Saturday night in a powerless conference room. The staff made notes what was of what was needed. Uh, like a large part of the available parking, uh, an estimated 40% was unusable. Those parking lots could be salvaged, that could be salvaged, wouldn't need gravel to harden the mud. In fact, lots and lots of gravel. So the call went out and the community immediately responded. A local rock quarry opened up late Saturday night, nearly 900 tons of gravel, 40 whole truck loads were brought in by another local company. Yet another local paving companies brought in equipment to spread that gravel. That gravel. The local community college offered its parking lots to those who had purchased parking in advance, the same parking that was part of the 40% that couldn't be salvaged. The local Boy Scouts chapter offered buses normally used to carry scouts to provide shuttle service from those college parking lots to the track. Now, power wasn't restored until 2 o'clock Sunday morning. By then, dozens of people were working, cleaning the grounds, spreading gravel, while the local police worked to set up a new traffic patterns. Word was spread via social media about the changes, and those of us there help amplify that. Bottom line, an entire community came together again to meet a challenge. In all, it was sort of a middle finger to Mother Nature. Now, these folks in the North Wilkesboro community had to, had to come together to get this track reopened, get it back on the schedule. He did that magnificently, and here was another challenge, and they overcame it. And the only thing fans noticed Sunday was a delayed opening of the gates. By 10 a.m., fans were streaming into the track. Dump trucks were gone. Gravel was spread where needed. 
empty garbage cans stood upright along the side of the portable toilets. And by the time the truck series, the delayed truck series race took the green flag, the sun was shining, the, the, the stands were filled, and Saturday was nothing more than an unpleasant memory. And you know, and NASCAR announced on the Friday prior to that weekend that the all-star race will return to North Wilkesboro. That's no doubt welcome news to the community in the area, a community that proved they can meet just about any challenge thrown at it. I looked at the full grandstand Sunday evening in the clear skies and marveled about how they got it all done. Just an incredible challenge that they met. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I loved the race. Now, look, Joey Logano led all but one lap. I stood on top of Victory Lane, which is on top of the media center, and watched the race. To see those cars as fast as they could go around that place uh, on that short track was just incredible. You really had to see it in person. So, yeah, there wasn't a lot of passing. There was passing towards the back. But Joey Logano, who did test there and ran some 800 laps a couple months prior uh, doing, a, doing a tire test, uh, dominated and, and won the million dollars. Sadly, that was not the story of the race. Not that, not the, the, the alternate tires. Uh, early in the race, uh, uh, Kyle Busch and Ricky Stenhouse Jr. got together. I'm not going to try to break that down, who was at fault and who wasn't. Now, after the race, they, of course, got in a fight. And unless you've been living in a cave, you know all about that. NASCAR's overhyped that thing. So let me tell you what happened in the fight and why I wasn't there like everybody else. So I'm standing on the top. Uh, victory lane watching the race standing there beside richard childers as a matter of fact and i didn't hear when i saw i saw ricky stenhouse after his car was wrecked i saw him bring the car to kyle bush's pit and park it and walk away i saw that part but i didn't realize that what uh ricky stenhouse jr said on tv was he was going to wait for kyle bush well duh there's no tunnel at that track so when they're racing uh unless you're dying of a heart attack you're stuck there. So, you know, that was kind of bravado, but I didn't know this. Okay. So after the race, I went down to pit road. I was standing, talking to some crew members, talked to Booty Barker, um, uh, Bubba Wallace, how their race went and stuff. Nothing, you know, kind of casual. I was looking to see if anything was going on. I see this crowd coming led by Kyle Bush walking down pit lane. I followed him, started to, and got about halfway and thought, you know, it's just, just, Kyle Bush being Kyle Bush, he's upset. He, he didn't win or, you know, the Ricky Stenhouse thing. He's going to go to his holler, turn around, say something stupid and go in his holler. I did not realize about the fight. A few minutes later, I'm walking into the, to the, uh, to the media center. And there was, there was people running in. I said, Jordan Bianchi comes running by, uh, you know, and I'm like, what the heck's going on? Why are these guys running? Well, of course, in the age of social media, you got to get the video out there. Um, and then, so I saw Todd Christie was running, um, you know, a lot of other people and they were putting their video and that's when I knew about the fight. So of course I missed out on the fight. I don't regret that too much. I kind of wish I would have followed, but I made the decision I made and, and that's it. Uh, and it happened. So I don't, uh, I didn't, like I said, I didn't know Stenhouse was waiting on Bush. His dad got into it. Um, and then, and then, you know, the, the controversy and all that. And of course, NASCAR's hyping that we're going to get to that in rants in a few minutes. Um, so I don't, did you see the all-star race? Did you watch it? I did get to watch it. It was a little bit late in my time, but I did get to watch it, um, catch up. So I knew the fight had happened by the time the race was over, which kind of spoiled it a little bit, but obviously came out of, came as the result of Stenhouse crowding Kyle into the wall, at least in Kyle's view, Kyle goes up and, onto the bumper of Stenhouse, pushes him through the following corner, and that ends up sending Stenhouse veering right straight into the wall head on. Terminal damage to that car, he's out of the race. So that's what gets Stenhouse so angry. Obviously, he waits, ambushes ambushes Kyle by his hauler with the help of some of his crew guys and his dad. So really interesting situation. Obviously, gotten promoted. We'll talk about that, but certainly the highlight reel of that race. Yeah, and, 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 the, and you know, the, he was ambushed. Um because I think, and just looking at it, trying to digest it, that that Ricky was trying to explain what had happened. And I think Kyle was starting to come around to think that, okay, maybe I did mess up um, because I don't think he intentionally did anything. 
Um, but before he had a chance to apologize uh, and maybe come out and say, okay, maybe I was wrong. Um, you know, I think, I think Ricky kind of went off the deep end and threw the punch and, you know, everything beyond that was just, was just cake. So yeah. And then the hype and, and how could you not, I mean, the, the earth could have fallen off its axis and that would not have been as big a news as this fight was, which, you know, on one hand is good. Um, but you know, everybody, everybody knew it, but, um, Tuesday night, I stayed in North Carolina last week between the all-star race and and um the coke 600 so tuesday night there was an event at the childress winery now i love the childress winery the guy made me a wino uh i used to think that you know you get some boone's farm and that's wine in 1999 maybe in 2000 i did a magazine article on the childress winery i went there spent a couple days uh hung out and with their sommelier who's the fellow that makes the wine uh, and he explained the whole process and he got me kind of centered on what kind of wine I like. So I started to like wine and, and now I couldn't imagine a meal without a, a decent meal, uh, without a, a nice bottle of wine. And I get it. I understand it. We now have a, we have a wine cooler here at my house. We belong to a local wine club. So the whole thing. So anyway, I love the Childress winery. The other, one thing I didn't like that night is I wanted to go talk to Richard about the Bush situation, obviously. Um, but it was kind of a political fundraiser kind of thing for veterans. Um, I don't like to get involved in politics at all. There'll be more about that later. But I did want to go talk to Richard. So I did talk to Richard and he agreed with us that he said uh, and he told me it was bad that he ambushed. The, by, he was ambushed by those guys. If it had been just straight up fight, but it was ambushed, well coordinated. Can't argue with that. And then he came on TV. Then, then he come on TV and said he was going to wreck the eight car at Charlotte. I put the word out. I got it where I hope he gets to him. And if he does, I'm kind of old for fighting, but I'll have a different style of fighting and I'll whip his ass. So that was that. So that was my Richard Childers quote uh, for that. And, and, and I had asked Richard off the record, if their penalties were coming out, this was Tuesday. He said, yeah, they're going to be announced in the morning. And then Ricky Stenhouse Jr. was fined $75,000 for that which is controversial in and of itself because it's one of the biggest fines ever for fighting. His dad was suspended indefinitely and two crew members. Um, I think that was justified because his dad was in the middle of this uh, and the two crew members as well. So that was my big takeaway was the fight, but you know, there was also racing uh, and, and the short track package may have been a factor uh, along with the non-factor of the two tire compounds. Right, we've talked about the short track package ad nauseum this year, but we've got to talk about it again. Obviously, Logano led all but one lap of that race, which looked like the racing may have been dull, but I didn't think it was that bad throughout the field. I think especially Logano was able to carry the line through the race for going from the bottom up to the top some, which I think was an interesting interesting sign, just given that the track was recently repaved. I felt like it put on a, something of a different race than it did last year. But of course, the big part of the race was good. You're bringing an alternate tire compound to try and create some of that Bristol excitement. We didn't quite get that with the tire where we got at Bristol earlier this year, but the alternate tires ended up making some degree of strategy on pit road with some drivers pitting late and able to make up spots on the track, but it wasn't enough to get to get to the lead. I'd like to see alternate tires on the short tracks going forward, maybe with some more degree of wear between them. But I think it would be a really interesting additional strategy element. And I think the short tracks, as, as it stands for the next gen car, kind of need that as it is yeah and 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 i agree with you i don't think they went far enough on the alternate compounds i love that idea i know they do it in indycar um they do it in formula one um and and i think it's a great idea i think they need to experiment with it more more and i think the all-star race is a perfect place to do that because it's a non-points event um so we could see that in the clash which by the way will not be in la next year um, and, I, and I'm hearing it's going to be, I think we talked about this before, it's going to be Bowman Gray, which is great um, because my family lives up there. So I stay at mama's house. Um, but uh, the only thing I'm kind of hesitant about, I think Bowman Gray will be a great race. It'll be a great venue and all that. But um, Winston-Salem, North Carolina in January and February, when the time frame is for the clash, is you, a lot of times not the ideal weather. So we'll have to see. But if you know what? If we get up there and, and the weather's mild and everything, I think it'll be great, fantastic. 
Um, so we'll see. The schedule should come out any day now. It wouldn't wouldn't surprise me. So we'll see that. You know, something else that that uh, happened last week. Obviously, the the, uh, the Hall of Fame class was announced. My buddy, uh, my former employer, Carl Edwards, who I worked for with for a short time, uh, Ricky Rudd and Ralph Moody were inducted into the Hall of Fame. And I want to, and I love Carl. He has been a great friend of mine. He's he's helped everything. I don't know necessarily think he was the right choice this time around. He deserves to be in there because his flamboyant style did add a lot to NASCAR. Um, he did win a, an Xfinity championship. Um, but I think there was other, there's, you know, it could have been somebody else. Ricky Rudd obviously is deserving. Ralph Moody, forget about it. He, he should have been in a long time ago. So that's great. Um, but I also know we had Dr. Dean Stickling who won the land landmark award for contributions to the sport. Right. Dr. Dean Sicking, who created the Safer Barrier, in addition to a lot of other contributions on public highways, who's obviously saved a lot of lives on and off the track with those, won the Landmark Award for his contributions to the sport. I think that's incredibly deserving. Clearly an incredible invention has been adopted by other motorsports, the Safer Barrier, but also a very valuable and important life. So I think it's very, very good to recognize him for his work. So very deserving winner of the Landmark Award for me. And then when it comes to the actual... In driver inductees. I do agree with you about Carl Edwards. And I think the big point for me was, especially with inducting um, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and other drivers like that, the voters have sort of focused on not just the impact on the racetrack, but also off. And while Carl Edwards has every right to enjoy his retirement, I think especially for me on that list, Jeff Burton, who's up in the NBC booth, has made such a monumental contribution to the sport through that that maybe Carl has six more wins or something to that effect in the cup series. I think Burton has done a whole lot more for the sport. And by that metric, he would have been my vote. And I think a lot of the voters did agree. Or Edwards only got 52% of the vote compared to Rudd who got something <laughs> something like 80. So I think, there, I, I think a lot of the voters were in agreement with us in that respect, but obviously excellent driver, very deserving pick and can't fault him being in the hall of fame by any means. Yeah. And, and, and you know, something I thought about later, we have the same industry folk every year and the same NASCAR officials um, as the voting panel, but we have the same core media that always goes. I would like to see those rotate because I think you would get differing opinions and differing votes. And I think until you do that, you're going to get the, because they're, you know, the, the memories are going to be long and they're going to remember next year who they voted this year. Um, and then it's going to kind of come to default. Whereas I think if we, introduced and there's plenty of other media members and that's not take away from the media members that are there they're deserving that's great wonderful let's mix it up let's get some 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 uh, a different influx in there because i think there's some guys that have been writing on that um that induction that are inducted or, or that the nominees that are nominated every year who don't get a chance um and may never have a chance because there may be some bias against some of them by some media members and maybe we could just you know, uh, shake it up a little bit. So we'll see the induction ceremony obviously is in January. Um, I have never been to one, even though I go up there, I may go this year, obviously because of my connection to Carl. And, and, and again, he deserves to be in the hall of fame, maybe not this class. Um, and I don't fault him for stepping away from the sport. He has a wonderful life. His wife is a doctor and she's practicing medicine now. And Kate, and, and the kids and the ki I can't believe the kids are almost teenagers. Um, I can remember when they were born. So, you know, good for him. I'm glad. And I don't want to take anything away from it. It's it, it is deserving. So that was the other thing, you know, with the uh, with the, uh, the Hall of Fame. And um, I'll see if I can get up there next year and go to the induction ceremony. So and I agree with you. I didn't think about Jeff Burton. That's that's a good call. Uh, Jeff Burton has won some crown jewel events um, and 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 deserves it as well. And I think he's done just as much for the sport, especially like you said, out, out of the car, um, you know, with the NBC and all that. So, and he's a great ambassador. He was at the Indy 500 uh, mm -hmm. as part of that crew, which I, which was weird to me, him and Kim Kuhn, uh, seeing them walk around, but he did a great job. So he's representing NASCAR very well. So let's fast forward to Saturday <clears throat> for the Coke 600. I talked to Stenhouse on Saturday, and he said he had talked to Childress. So, um, and we still are. Um, yeah, I think um, we have a, a pretty good understanding of each other, and um, you know, we've both done the same thing now. So, um, you know, I think uh, him and I are in a good spot. Ricky, you kind of bowed on video to, to, to wreck Kyle, and uh, 
on Sunday. I mean, have you? Uh, if you watch the Joy's podcast, I, uh, you know, said that was just heat of the moment. Um, you know, you never, never want to wreck anybody on purpose, especially somewhere like Charlotte um, or or anywhere for that matter. Um, you know, I felt like. Like I've said before, you know, I got a ton of respect for what you know, Kyle has done in a race car. It's you know more than than most people in this this garage area combined of what he's been able to accomplish. But you know, I lost a lot of respect for him, you know, crashing us on purpose. Um, you know, especially in, in that moment. So um, you know, yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna waste my time, you know, trying to get him back uh, at Charlotte because I think for us, if we focus on on what we're capable of doing here i think you know we'll be able to uh, uh accomplish a, a really good race you know it's behind him nothing happened in the coke 600 um so we'll see going forward maybe he has talked to kyle bush by now but last saturday when i talked to him he hadn't done that yet so weather again played a factor in both races specifically the indy 500 i was part of a media scrum Talking to Kyle Larson on Thursday, that poor guy was just getting pulled everywhere. Um, and and he's he they hadn't made the decision, he said, uh, about whether he was going to stay or go or whatever, start the race, whatever. He said it was going to be a game time decision. Well, it 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 turned out that they had made a decision before that, and the decision was that he was going to stay there and run the Indy 500 no matter what. Um, and then they delayed it by a couple hours, which kind of jumped up against um the start of the coke 600 normally the way it works you got monaco in the morning then you've got indy 500 and then you've got the coke 600 and normally we're watching the indy 500 in the media center at charlotte motor speedway that didn't happen this year obviously because um it started late so it started as pre-race was starting for um as, as matchbox 20 was doing their concert which by the way was really cool uh and a huge crowd sold out for the third time in a row a third year in a row and and it was it was it was fantastic i cannot tell you the, the crowds were simply amazing and huge um and we also had former president trump show up which was another kind of distraction and then people were watching this, their small screens because they didn't show it on the big screen like normal because they had all the pre-race going on so people are watching the indy 500 uh on their on their phones um the the public address announcers talking about it uh, Mr. Trump has a crowd everywhere he goes, so there's distractions there. Um, and and the only quiet time was was the start of the race. So they they got the race off, and and again we're still watching the Indy 500. The the track announcers in between all the everything that was going on was talking about where Kyle was. He led a lap uh, under uh, pit pit uh, during during pit stops. Crowd went wild. Meanwhile, there's some pretty decent racing going on in the Coke 600. Nobody seemed to care about that. They were all watching, you know, to see how Carl was doing and and where Trump was at. So they did the moment of silence. And, and I like this where they stop halfway at the race. Uh, they bring the cars down pit road. They shut the engines off. Um, and they had the moment of silence, uh, which I to me is very emotional, very cool. Loved it. I was in the press box, took part in that. As I walked out, the back of the press box um i got stopped by secret service agents and uh because trump was leaving and he was walking down the hall uh so you know five feet away and whatever and thank you get out of here because again everybody was more focused on that so larson finishes 18th in the indy 500 makes the flight down there we see the helicopter come in couldn't land on the in infield like uh, with with Kurt Busch. Kurt Busch landed on the infield pre-race when he did it in 2017. I was there. I remember that. And they bring Kyle in. They had to stop the race for lightning, a lightning hold. So during that lightning hold, Kyle or Kyle Larson shows up, gets ready, puts, puts everything on, then the rains came. And long story short, Christopher Bell won the rain-shortened um, Coke 600. We had to wait two hours then they decided to call the race because um, it was past halfway um, or past the second stage. Um, and and he won the race. But you know what? There were so many distractions with with Trump and with Kyle and everything else. I think that kind of got lost in the lost in translation, so to speak. But I know for you, you had a long you had a long day. 
Yeah, I covered over on Cargenza, our sister site, the rest of the racing besides the Coke 600, so uh, Monaco and Indy. So check out Cargenza.com for that. And just to kind of profile it a little bit, starting the day on my side of the pond uh, for Monaco, it was Ferrari and McLaren, not Red Bull, who ran away with that. Max Verstappen ended up no better than sixth. In fact, he started no better than sixth. Every one of the top 10 finished exactly where they started. So a very different style of racing than what we got at Indy and, Coke, and the Coke 600. Um, there were four, only four on-track passes that entire race out of uh, some 78-something laps. So very, um, very dull race, despite a very chaotic start. After the first lap, nothing happened. Then in the Indy 500, obviously my focus was on Kyle Larson, and he suffered from some rookie inexperience. He started from sixth, which was really good speed throughout the, the whole month of qualifying and practice. But rookie inexperience, they don't practice restarts, and he bled spots when he spun his wheels and grabbed the wrong gear. Then he locked up getting onto pit road later in the race, got a speeding penalty, it passed through, put him a lap down, got that lap back through some strategy, but never was able to get up and back into contention with no yellow flags. A lot of yellow flags early, but no yellow flags really in the second half of the race. So while NASCAR fans might be disappointed with Larson finishing poorly and the Charlotte rain out, it was a great Indy 500, I think, that showed how, go how good that race can be to someone, a NASCAR fan, potentially watching it for the first time. After the kinks were worked out in the beginning of the race, with it uh, seemed like the track was still a little bit, maybe a little bit damp, not entirely set for racing with a lot of drivers just spinning by themselves. The series' most popular driver, Pato Award, ended up chasing Joseph Newgarden, defending race winner, who's we talked about some of the cheating issues he's faced earlier this year, getting a victory rescinded. Award made his move with a few corners to go, giving Newgarden a chance to get right back on him on the backstretch, and Newgarden managed to make the pass. On the backstretch, giving Pato dirty air, he wasn't able to make the pass, and Newgarden was the first repeat winner in 22 years. Really puts the cheating allegations, or the, not allegations, really, he got the win rescinded. It puts that all behind him. And he had to do that win with it without his normal strategist, without his engineer, since they've been suspended. And so the question really becomes, one point is, will Larson get a championship a playoff waiver? NASCAR's rules say that even with the win and you're in playoff system that we have, you have to be a full-time driver even when you get that win to still be in. And missing races for lack of sponsorship or breaking the substance abuse policy in the past with some truck series precedent has not been enough to get a waiver. Granted, we granted a waiver last year to Chase Elliott, who was suspended for hooking Denny Hamlin at Charlotte in this race, uh, but Chase didn't end up making the playoffs, so it became a moot point. I didn't like the decision then, I'll say that now, um, and I don't. I still don't like it now, but I think it sets the precedent that a waiver probably will be granted here. Um, even though Larson made a choice to be out of the race, he still made an effort to get into the race car. He promoted the sport in a on, on the biggest race of the weekend. And I think there's no reason based on that precedent not to grant him a waiver. Well, and something, and I think they're going to grant him a waiver. There's, there's no question. Kurt Busch was granted one. He was suspended for three races back in 2015 for some um, um, domestic abuse allegations um, that got cleared up, but uh, they granted him a waiver. I think they will. I think, I think that NASCAR holds that out there for, to avoid a part-time driver. So if you get a start and park or a part-time driver who maybe gets lucky and wins a race, who says, well, I can't race for, for this, you know, and I'm not going to race. I think they hold it out for that. So I'm sure they will. Um, I mean, cause L Larson did more to, to promote NASCAR than anything. Um, the expose it to the Indy 500 fans, the, the, the NASCAR fans were watching the Indy 500 and yes, it was a fantastic race. Uh, I loved it. Um, so I think they will grant him a waiver uh, and it would be great. You know, if, if Kyle comes in and wins the championship this year, um, I think I'm going to go out on a limb and say one of the RFK cars are probably going to be in the top four and, and, and has a good, have a good chance at the championship this year, but that's a discussion for another time. By the way, Saturday, Austin Hill showed his emotion uh, with 17 laps remaining in the, the Xfinity race and got into Cole Custer and pushed him up the track and uh, and just kind of pushed him down the wall. Well, he was fined twenty five thousand uh, dollars today, Wednesday, um, and docked twenty five driver points for that. So bad, bad Austin Hill. Don't do that again. Um, so there was some other news. Let me think. What was the other news? Oh yeah, Stuart Haas is closing. Okay, I did not have this on my bingo card. Oh man, um, they started this team. You know, Carl Haas started this team 
uh, Haas CNC back in 2002. He was a sponsor for Hendrick Motorsports and then started his own team, Haas CNC, uh, and then brought Tony Stewart on board. I remember that press conference when Tony Stewart announced it and people were, you know, very skeptical. And in his first season there, he won four races. They went on to win two championships, one with Tony, one with Kevin. But we kind of saw the, the 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 cards last year when when uh, Kyle uh, when when Kevin Harvick started to to when he was retiring, we started losing sponsors. That's what I was trying to say. Um, so when he was when he was starting to lose sponsorship, uh, and I saw that kind of that kind of put the writing on the wall. And Kevin Harvick did say this week that he, you know his core team kind of kept everything going. So yeah, it it happened, but. Um, I, I really didn't expect them to shut down. So now there's four charters for sale, actually three because front row motorsports bought one. And even though they didn't say it, um, they announced today that they're going to a three car team next year. So that's one of the drivers from Stuart Haas probably. Uh, but I can guarantee you uh, that it's one of the charters. The thing, the, And I feel bad for all the employees at Stuart Haas because there's some great men and women over there, but you know something I feel worse for, for Chase Briscoe. Um, I consider him a friend. We've talked. Uh, you know, it's a crazy time for him. He grew up idolizing. He's from Indiana. He grew up idolizing Tony Stewart, who was a big figure in racing in Indiana in sprint cars. And so was Chase. And I mean, I just couldn't imagine how happy he was when he was picked uh, by Stewart to run the 14 car that Stewart ran. So, uh, you know, I feel sorry for him. Uh, and, and again, it's going to be it's going to depend on, um, you know, what happens. I, I kind of wonder if somebody else is going to jump in here and either take the assets or something with, uh, with that team. Okay. So Stuart Haas racing is closing. Um, and, and for, for a myriad of reasons, like I said, Kevin Harvick is, you know, was right. He talked about it on his podcast this week about how he was kind of the, the, uh, the anchor, his team was kind of the anchor and I, and I agree with him. Um, but he didn't win last year. Sponsors didn't want to stay. They lost some big sponsors. Uh, and obviously there's, there's something else going on behind the scenes. And, and it's, and it's like we were talking about Owen. it's like you said, you know, with the drag racing and, and Gene Haas with the F1 team. And I know you got your take on that. Well, right. We know Stewart's been drag racing this year, performing well at the top level of the NHRA, replacing his, his wife now as they look to start a family, but obviously that's occupied his attention. He's been critical, too, of NASCAR management in the past. Obviously, he spoke about Ford, his his unhappiness with Ford not letting him sign Larson. Um, and then it, on the other half of the ownership side, it seems to me that Gene Haas wants to focus on the F1 team, which really hasn't been performing well these past couple seasons either. But we've talked about the Andretti bid to get into F1. There's a postscript here. This week, the FIA chairman advised Andretti to buy an existing team instead to get into the sport. And it seems like Haas would be the obvious choice there. So I expect Haas F1 to be on something of the chopping block for the foreseeable future. We'll see if Congress's intervention maybe gets Andretti into the sport another way. We'll see if they end up buying Haas or we'll see what happens. But it's something to look look for, see if, see if Gene Haas maybe puts more money into it, see if their performance maybe improves. I kind of think that, that Gene Haas once likes his F1 team and he's going to focus on that. And obviously Tony Stewart, I think, is having a ball. Um, you know, they're trying to start a family. He's drag racing, like you said, he's doing well, um, and that's a whole different animal over there. But let's talk about the real estate they've got. They've got a shop. Um, they've got all the equipment. They've got some great people, some great drivers. They've got uh, they've got a, a, the the wind tunnel. Haas CNC has has the wind tunnel um, that's state of the art. They're also a Hendrick satellite team, or were a Hendrick satellite team. Now there were some people saying that Junior Motorsports might want to come into cup with that. I'm not really on board with that because Dale Jr. has been kind of adamant that he doesn't want to go cup racing. This could, I mean, he could be motivated to do that, but <clears throat> I'm just not quite sure that, that he's ready there. Um, but I could see a new team from an outside owner. We've had some other people that have talked about it, AKA like, you know, with the pit bull and, 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 and things like that. Um, and 23, 11 racing uh, with Michael Jordan, and, and, and like I said, the track house, I could see something like that happening. <clears throat> Obviously, it looks like Front Row has got one of the charters, so it could be a three-car team. It could be a two-car team. They may sell the other charter, um, but I don't see that building going unused and all that equipment and all that personnel. Hey, it's only, what, May, almost June. Uh, we got a long time until November, 
So it would not surprise me um, to it, we could see a move like like with Chip Ganassi when he sold off his stuff, <clears throat> and 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 so and and it went to Trackhouse, and now Trackhouse has been successful. So it's twenty three eleven. Um, so we could see that. Um, I, like I said, the, the real estate is well positioned for a Hendrick satellite facility. So it could be something like that, uh, or an outside owner wanting to get in the sport. So. Um, and, and, and you brought up another point about the charter negotiations. Right. I think it really shows, it underlines how important the charter negotiations are to these teams. We still haven't had a resolution with NASCAR, but the charter lets these, lets Stewart and Haas recoup their assets after walking away. Now, I, I imagine SHR just kind of on the fire sale element might have to sell them for a bit cheaper, but the market has been 40, 60 million for some of these charters, which is very real money to be able to get back after leaving NASCAR and might be more motivation for someone to enter the sport, especially if we can get a staple charter deal. If we don't get one, then we'll see what yeah. happens from there. But the teams are working towards one. Yeah. And Bob Pockers pointed out yesterday um, that NASCAR did come out with a new charter offer. And what the teams want is a, is a permanent charters. Um, NASCAR is still not on board with that, but they, they, they are offering to, to keep the charters going till 2031, which goes beyond the current TV deal. So I think they're coming to an agreement. Um, and like I said, like we said, Wednesday today, uh, Front Row Motorsports has already snatched up one of those charters. So we'll have to see. And I agree with you about the fire sale idea that, you know, they may get away a lot cheaper and somebody may get a, may get a deal. Uh, I mean, it would be great. So that being said. Just rant and rave like you do to the TV during sport. Let's talk about the fat fan, the, the, the fight hype. I mean... We kept seeing this fight. We saw it at the part of the Indy 500 coverage, for God's sakes. We saw it all over social media. Now, there was people who were saying, why is NASCAR fining Ricky Stenhouse Jr. $75,000 on the one hand and promoting it on the other? Well, guess what, boys and girls? Their marketing arm is separate from the officials. The marketing arm was probably salivating like, you know, a dog looking at a steak. Uh, because they knew that would be some great promotion, and it was. But we saw it flipping everywhere. Um, I mean, I'm surprised I didn't walk in the grocery store and see it on the monitors, for God's sakes. So, yeah, it was it was a lot, but, um, you know, it was, it was okay. Uh, but the people complaining about NASCAR hyping it and finding there are two separate entities. The marketing is separate from the official side of things. And they jumped on it, and rightfully so, and it did promote the sport. But guess what? The fight's over. We got a regular, whole regular season to go. Let's let's put that behind us. The other thing I found kind of odd, the race stoppage um, Saturday night at the Coke 600. So it rained, and the track got wet. The humidity was, was setting in. It was 1130 when they called the race. I was sitting there, and there were still a lot of fans because the rain had stopped. Um, and there was a collective boo out of the stands. What I don't think people understood that night is we probably still had a, a 90 minutes to two hours yet left to dry the track, which would have put it at 1 a.m. And, and there were still over 100 laps left, 150 laps. Man, that's a lot of racing. Uh, I, I can think back to um, years ago when Tony Stewart won his first Coke, Coke, uh, Coke 400 at, at Daytona. And there was rain delayed. And I got home literally as the sun was coming up. So that I think that would have been the same scenario Saturday night. And everybody had been there all day. Enough was enough. I think they, they made the right call. But the fans that booed, um, I think we could have done a better job that night of explaining to them why we're not racing, why we had to, st why we had to stop. Humidity was too high. It was going to take too long. We didn't want people out on the on the roads at three o'clock in the morning after you've been drinking at the track all day. So I think it was a good decision. Um, but, but I think we could have done a little better job with that. And Elton Sawyer did come on Sirius XL on Tuesday and did explain it uh, that way, but that was a little too late. So, um, and then, and then the penalty, like we said, was, was a little controversial, but I, you know, $75,000, that's a lot of money, but um, you had your take on that. Right. I agree with the penalty itself. The $75,000, uh, the monetary amount you can quibble with, but I think ambushing someone should not be celebrated as showing emotion. If there's no other way to get out of the racetrack, don't wait by someone taller. 
talk it out after the race instead of throwing the punch. Um, and I would certainly rather NASCAR focus on the race rather than market a fight. I mean, I think every other motorsport that weekend is promoting the racing action on the track, whereas NASCAR's marketing team is focusing on the fight. It, there wasn't that much racing action. I, I, I agree, but I, I don't, I, I think it, it shows a bit of a dichotomy in the types of motorsports we're getting. But I don't think that the promotion means there can't be penalties. We promote wrecks all the time, especially when we go to Talladega or Daytona. Those have consequences, and there's a driver at fault usually, but those still make the highlights. And even on the egregious wrecks with like Austin Hill, who went and turned Cole Custer after a perceived slight, um, that will probably still be promoted. So I think the fine is justified, and I think you can still promote it. I'm not sure they should, but I think they have every right to. And they did so. Um, and, you know, good right. for them. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll see. We have plenty of opportunities to have fights the rest of the season. So cue them up, boys. We'll give you some boxing gloves or maybe do it MMA style um, in, in, in that. So this week, the guys aren't off. Larson is testing at Iowa. There's also testing uh, uh, at the Brickyard. Iowa's done a repave. Obviously, we're going to be there uh, in, in a few weeks at Iowa and the Brickyard. I'm looking forward to the Brickyard. I think it's going to be great to, to be on the big track again. But Goodyear's testing there this week and, and at Iowa. And already there's some head scratching about the Iowa pavement and the repave. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but we're going to go to uh, Gateway, Worldwide Technology Raceway. I don't like to call it WWTR or whatever it is. They don't pay me. So it's Gateway. Uh, Kyle Busch was last year's winner. So hopefully he can get back in, in the groove and and, and win win. Uh, win this week and defend defend his win but you also made another point about uh about gateway well it's another short track we know how good the toyotas have been at those this season but i think that this track has produced a really interesting variety of winners compared to some of the other short tracks kyle bush and a chevy last season like you said joey logano in the ford two seasons ago the first time we came back makes it hard to pick a winner but for my pick this week i'm gonna go with joey logano he obviously has won at this track in the past but he was second at Richmond this season, won the All-Star race, both of which are short tracks, and he really needs an official win. Right now, he wouldn't make the playoffs on points if it started this week. He's 17th in points, which is really crazy for the 22 group at this stage in the season. I think Logano gets it done. I think he, he showed the, the flash of that performance at the All-Star race, and I think he knows how to win, win here. So he's my pick for Gateway. Okay, well, there you go. Um, and are you going to have time to get a uh, to get a preview up this week? Or are you going to be traveling? We should get a preview up. We'll see what we get. Maybe maybe, a little bit, right. maybe on Friday, but we'll see what we get. <laughs> All right. So it'll it'll be before the race, but it just may not be on the usual Thursday night. <laughs> so we'll see you back across the pond next weekend. But then you're heading. You're a world traveler. You're going to what? Peru. Yes. Ah, see, see, I'm stuck here in Orlando listening to my neighbors cut down their trees in the 90s. Is it still? It's 96 degrees. So. Yeah, so we'll see. Uh, I for this weekend, I I think I'd like to see Kyle Busch win it, but um, I also think that um, one of the RFK cars could step up to the plate. We'll see, we'll see. Uh, but that's a good point about Joey, and I didn't realize that that he is he's not eligible for the playoffs yet. Still a long way to go, but he's been kind of struggling. So the Fords need to step up the, to the plate. Yeah, they won, but they need to, to win some more. So we'll see what happens. Oh, and thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Safe travels. Welcome back to the United States next week on your stopover to Peru. Thank you. Great, great to great to do it again. All right. Thank you guys. We appreciate it. Appreciate the support. Make sure to subscribe and like, comment below, reach out, say hi, or tell me to go stuff myself or whatever. Um, and, and we appreciate the support. We'll see you next time, everybody. Take care. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to Speed Talk Live. For questions or just to tell us how bad our production is or to leave other feedback, leave us a comment below. For all the latest NASCAR news, visit www.cupscene.com. Until next time, peace out and let's go racing.
Great job, driver.